Hello everyone and welcome to the Performance Cafe. And uh, I, I say this every week, but or we just have, we're really blessed to have such great individuals who come and visit with us. And this morning uh, I have someone with me, Carl Bates uh, from Sadar Group, and I met Carl probably more than a year ago now when we were still actually doing training uh, in, you know, in person. And Carl and, and I met through the um, Contribution Compass, where he is the founder and uh, the exec executive for that company as well. So Carl is a, an entrepreneur and a thought leader. He's uh, from New Zealand, but he spends a lot of time visiting with us in South Africa. He's considered a global leader in the education, appointment and guidance of high performance boards. And I just thought it was fascinating and something we should discuss with him today. He is also an expert in maximizing individual and team contribution in order to maximize return. And that's, of course, where we're going to talk about his product, the Contribution Compass. So help me to welcome entrepreneur, speaker, author, mentor, director, generally fabulous person, Carl, to the Performance Cafe. How are you, Carl? Very good, thank you. And thank you so much for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. Hopefully my coffee is on the way. I have requested it, so it should be here soon. I that's perfect. When you come to South Africa, remind me, I'll give you a performance cafe version that you can, awesome. you know, use so that you can push my brand for me. <laughs> I'm not self-serving at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Carl, um, thanks so much for visiting here and for sparing the time. I know it's hectic and I know it's uh, at the end of a busy day for you because for once you're in New Zealand and not here with us. Um, that is true. Performance. I like to start these chats by asking, what is your version and what's your view of performance? So I think performance is something that is different for each person. And I suppose it's very contextual as well. Performance in one thing might not be performance in something else. Mm -hmm. Something that one person might consider a great performance, someone else might not consider to be a great performance. And so I really feel the key to understanding performance is mm. to ensure that if it's about your own performance, that you determine or, or write the definition of performance for that particular activity, whether it be in your personal life or in your business life, if it's working or delivering something to someone else, to ensure that there is clarity of understanding about what performance means. So a long answer in the context of, I don't think it's just A or B, but mm. I think it's very contextual to the conversation or the scenario uh, that you're considering as an individual, a leader, a team member, a business, whatever the mm. case may be. Absolutely. And do you think that somehow performance has changed with COVID? Do I think performance has changed with COVID? Now, that is a curveball. In the context Lovely. of COVID, excuse the pun, the, the, <laughs> the, uh, has, has performance changed in the context of COVID? Mm. I think that for a lot of people, what they're expected to do has changed. And mm. for many people that that's been a conscious discussion or decision between, for example, employer and employee, for example, between business and client or business and customer. I think for many businesses and many employees, performance has changed, but there hasn't been a conscious discussion of the fact that there is a change and a conscious decision to make the change. And I think that that's causing a lot of people unnecessary stress mm. and unnecessary anxiety. I think it's also resulting in businesses failing, not because of COVID. And I think a lot of people get caught on this, well, my business failed because of COVID. Did it fail because of COVID or did it fail because things shifted and you didn't shift with it? Did it fail because it was failing before COVID and, and COVID just brought it to light. So yes, definitely COVID has an impact on performance. And I just want to make sure I say, but so I don't sound like I'm 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 not recognizing that there have been some genuine businesses mm -hmm. that have been affected because of COVID and, and couldn't have avoided it in any other way. If you were, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to go into examples, I think we all know the sort of businesses I'm talking about. Mm. So <clears throat> it's an interesting thing. We have a, a, a colleague or a friend in common, Renata, and uh, she always says it's always <coughs> important to go and take a look. Was your business failing before COVID? <laughs> yeah. And then we decide if COVID helped, uh, was the reason your business failed. So, so I'm with you entirely. 
So the same question about success. What does success mean? And do you think there's been a shift? So I think success is, again, contextual and, again, defined by the context. So I, I'm going to take my previous answer, if you like, and, and cut and paste it a little bit. Because I think, in many ways, performance and, and, and success have a very similar sort of understanding in that context. I think that the, the bigger question that you're asking is, has it changed as a result of COVID? And mm. I, I do feel that COVID has had an impact on what success means for people and for businesses. I feel like many businesses have started to understand how they can be more successful because they're understanding what the drivers of their businesses are much more. I think for many of us as individuals, mm -hmm. we've redefined what success means in our own life. I, I'm certainly going through a little bit of a process at the moment where I'm understanding what I want mm -hmm. success to look like in the years to come. And COVID yeah. has had an absolute impact on that. Indeed. And uh, I know that you have, have a young child because we, we frequently hear him in our background. And I suppose that I, I sort of feel like there's a move towards whole people again, which, <clears throat> sorry, which I appreciate because I feel like all of a sudden dad is allowed to have dad time despite COVID because, mm -hmm. you know, there was this realignment. So I think that's, that's for me a big positive. So Carl, please tell us what does Sadar do? group do I, I thought that if you just worked long enough in a company and you made it enough money you'd become an executive and then eventually land up on the board <laughs> so obviously I, at my age no one's asked me to serve on a board so I haven't been doing that much good tell me where am I going wrong so I think it's a great question and I think you're not alone there are a lot of people who believe that the role of a director or directorship is like the career path, right? It's like I become, as exactly as you said, I'm a manager, I'm an executive, I become a director of the business. And I often say to people, becoming a director of the business that you're involved in, if you're a senior leader in listening to this conversation and you're believing that one day being a director of the company that you're in is, a, is an expectation as part of the career path, is something you deserve, I would ask you to think about what the role of a director in the context of a board of directors really means. And I think many people confuse this exactly like, like you do. Directorship is a profession in itself. Directorship is a craft of its own. And many directors are great managers. Many directors aren't great managers. Many great managers are good directors. Many great managers aren't great directors. Mm. Uh, you know, I think it was Warren Buffett that said once that just because you're a great chief executive doesn't automatically mean you're going to be a great director. And I think mm. that sometimes we, we think one equals the other. I think many of us, and could even be a number of listeners today, who think that because they're in business and a director of their own company, they know what it means to be a director. I think mm. the irony is, you know, unlike driving a car, where we, we have to get a license that makes sure we have some understanding of how to drive it and make sure it's not crashed. Anyone's allowed to open a business, become a director, and go and drive this car called a company and hopefully not crash it. And I think it's absurd. Mm. Directorship is a profession. It's a skill base that we need to make sure people have and, and needs a lot more focus than I think uh, many of us um, give it credit for. And so Sadar Group focuses on educating individuals to become directors, am I correct? So Sadar does three key things. We educate people about what it means to be a director. So we help them understand uh, what it means to be, what the role of a director is, how a director helps a business that they're involved in, whether it be a business that they're a shareholder manager in, or it's a business they're an executive in, looking to have a board to drive performance, or it's in a business where they have um, uh, an interest uh, in becoming an independent director or a non-executive director, and they want to understand what that role of being a director is. So a big part of what we do, educate people about the role and the value of a board. Second a part that we play is that we appoint directors to businesses, private, family, listed, and the like. We, we do some of our education of directors in partnership with organizations in South Africa, like the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, uh, and mm -hmm. into Africa with in institutes of directors and, and 
organizations across the continent. So that's the sort of realm that we work with there. And then the third thing that we do is we guide great boards, which really is about boardroom advisory and supporting boards to actually implement the, the governance and the expectations that we have of a high performance board that ultimately lead to business growth and profitability. We talk at CERDA about guiding boards and growing business. And I think it's really important that we understand mm -hmm. the direct connection between a good mm -hmm. board and a, and a great business performance. Perfect. So are you saying someone can study to become a director? Let's say someone like me that's never been on a board of directors. If I come to you and I say to you, okay, Carl, this is it. I'm going to break into the big time. Uh, I believe I value, even if those other guys haven't seen it yet. Um, what, what do you do? What are the steps to, to move in that direction? It's a re another really good question. Uh, yes, you can study to be a director, like you study to be an accountant, like you study to be a lawyer, as an example. And at Sadar Group, we work on focusing on what, what I call the practical and, a com and applicable components of being a director. I think too many people think that being studying to be a director or understanding what it means to be a director is about understanding just the law and the corporate codes of governance. But it's actually much more about understanding what do you do in the boardroom? What are the conversations you have? Yes. You know, one of the stories I often tell is, you know, I'm a chartered accountant. I'm a chartered member of the Institute of Directors in New Zealand. I'm a fellow of the Institute of Directors in South Africa. I've got a first class honours degree. And I, I share these things with you because through all of that journey, no one has ever sat me down to become a chartered accountant. You know, one of those advisors we turn to as businesses to go, you know, can you help me with my business? To become a chartered accountant. No one ever sat me down and said, Carl, this is what you do as a director. We get explained how to do the numbers, how to understand the difference between a partnership return and a sole trader or a company and how you deal with equity, how you manage dividends. But no one sits mm. you down and say, in the boardroom, this is what you do. No one sits you down and says, as a shareholder, these are the questions that you should ask. This is what mm. being a shareholder means. And that's really where the Sadar team focuses in developing the knowledge about being a director. So that's one of the ways you can build mm. that knowledge. But I think with many organizations, and with many professions rather, being a director is both about a skill, knowledge, and experience. And I think there's two parts of that experience. One is to be a director, you have to have an understanding of business. And I think too many yeah. people are appointed to the role of director, whether it be in their own business, whether it be elevated through career paths, or whether it be in public entities and organizations mm -hmm. that just have no context of this thing called business. Yeah. Secondly, I think you've got to have that natural ability, that that nous, that, that piece of um, skill that I think, like any role, makes you really successful. And I think like anything, there's a difference between being a craftsperson in, in that particular skill or, or genre, if you want to look at it that mm -hmm. way, and being the one that's on the listed company board. And I think many businesses, yeah. or sorry, many people don't understand that distinction. I think becoming a director is about the check you get to sit on uh, the board of a listed business. It, it's a journey. It's a career path. And you've mm -hmm. got to start somewhere. I'm just very lucky that I had the opportunity to, to serve as an independent director at a really young age. And so I've been serving on the board of directors of private and public organizations for, for 20 years. Okay. So since you were, let me see, about two, because, right, you're only <laughs> 20, right? I only had young people on performance camera. <laughs> exactly. You know, so funnily enough, I got my first independent directorship. And by that, I mean not connected to family businesses, not, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a sort yep. of tap on the shoulder from a family member or something like that. Got appointed yeah. as an independent director to a, a private hospital and a dementia care facility in mm -hmm. New Zealand when I was 18. Uh, so really, wow. my first, uh, first, first, first age of being able to be a director. You know, you've got to be 18 to be a director in New Zealand. And That's I was very lucky to get that opportunity. That is amazing. And, and what an awesome... What an awesome journey to, to get from there to here. What was the one biggest learning that you had in that growth path? Sure. I have had a lot of learning uh, when it comes yeah. to the boardroom, understanding the boardroom, uh, understanding the journey. 
I think the biggest learning is the value that you add when you're not involved in the business. Yeah. And sometimes these things that I say in a board meeting, and they seem obvious to me, but don't seem obvious to, um, to management. And I, I'll sometimes sit there in a board meeting and another independent director will say something that seems obvious to them. And I'll go, that's a, that's a really good insight. I wish I had had that insight and shared that one. But I think what that does is it gives you the understanding of this value you, you're, a, you're able to bring to the table by not being involved. And I think one of the biggest yeah. things that the directors are challenged with by people is how do you know what's going on when you're not involved? Well, the point is you bring a perspective because you're not involved. And I think all of us Thank in our you. lives experience that. You know, we've all sat down at some time with someone who's not involved in a situation and told them about the situation because we want their perspective. We want someone who's not mm. emotionally attached, not connected to the mm. discussion, being engaged. And it's the same in the boardroom. Well, it's so interesting that you say that because I suppose that to some extent in coaching, because you'll probably know this, we have this concept of reframing where people will come with a problem and as a coach you go through a guiding process where they reframe that problem for themselves and when they walk out they go why didn't i think of that and you go well actually you did i just asked questions <laughs> so as you say we do it every day through therapy and coaching and everything else so i do i do love that perspective um I suppose the one thing that when we speak directorship, sorry, and I know we said we weren't going to spend too much time on that. We want to get to Contribution <laughs> Compass, but I'm fascinated. Happy. Uh, well, happy. well, I might have to do another episode with you just on Contribution Why don't we do that? Where we keep talking about the boardroom because it's such a, such a rich conversation and so deep. And it's interesting, even just the story or the example you just painted around a coach and the role of a coach. And while I don't think I'm a particularly good coach because I'm much more uh, the sort of person you go to when you need someone to tell you what to do than, than yep. to ask the questions. I'm not not necessarily the best at asking questions to get you to answer it. I, I'm, I'm sort of better at the give me the problem and I'll give you a review. Hmm. I think the key difference with a board in the context of a company is it's a little bit more like a parent where if the company is the child, if you like, the board are the guardians. They have the authority over and while we can ask the questions of the management, um, and I'm not suggesting by any stretch of the imagination that management are children, but the, the legal context of a company is it is guarded by the directors, if you like. Well, you can ask questions of management and get them to hopefully see a different view. Sometimes, as a board, you've got to say, no, but we're not going to do that, or yes, we are. And if you can't get management to the view, it is ultimately the board that's accountable. So you have an engagement or an accountability in the relationship that you just don't have um, in, in a coaching relationship. I hear you. I hear you. And, and there's place for it all because what you describe in yourself is the mentor, is not the coach. And, and there's place for that. And then when you are taking that kind of responsibility, that's that's what it comes out to is that sometimes it's because you know this has been decided at this level but you bring up a very interesting thing now because now you're now really getting into the guts of what I want to talk about I want to talk to you about evil boards so we all know the stereotype right it's a bunch of people who are sitting there and they are basically not prepared to push the envelope because all that they want to do is make money for the investors so the investors won't be upset. And then, you know, when, when the investors have taken a lump sum, then the last couple of shreds go to the board and to the executives. And, you know, the poor person right at the bottom gets nothing and that boards don't, they don't care. Uh, we know the research, unfortunately, that the higher you are in an organization, the less likely you are to be hired for emotional intelligence. Please tell me that none of this is true. It simply cannot be. Otherwise, you need to hire me and a couple of bunny huggers to go and sit on the balls. So I think there's an interesting perspective, which I, I just want to catch before I go into the question, which is that you 
can't be in business and be emotionally intelligent or engaging and be interested in social well-being and be interested in the environment. And I'm a I'm a big believer in the fact that business is about both. You know, at the end of the day, the role of business is to ensure that that the businesses are contributing both a deliverable to society and they're paying taxes. If they're not profitable, they're not paying taxes. There's not money going into the system. They're not employing people. And last year during lockdown, this is a little bit of a side um, story, yeah. but I suppose we, we are having a coffee. So I'm allowed to, um, <laughs> I'm allowed to, <laughs> I'm, I'm allowed to meander a little bit, but I was involved mm. in a project called the lockdown collection which was fairly significant in South Africa and in the, in the fact that what we did was we captured the moment in history of the South African lockdown and created a fund to support vulnerable artists in South Africa. And it was very successful and, and was launched with 48 hours notice and, you know, some great things with my co-founders, uh, a, a lady by the name of Lauren Wolf, who is, is the founder of Mrs. Wolf um, and, and is a really creative and successful individual. And another lady by the name of Professor Kim Berman, who is at the University of Johannesburg and is the founder and executive director of uh, the Artist Proof Studio. Now, I come from a very business perspective. Lauren is a creative. Uh, she's in the art world. She's got connection to the art world. But she's also got an understanding of business. She's a businesswoman and an entrepreneur in her own right. And Kim is more of an academic, obviously an artist in her own right as well, successful artist in her own right, and has um, has obviously business knowledge because she's built this nonprofit. But what was really interesting through the journey was the value of the multiple components of engagement. This business-driven person, me, mm. with these uh, more sort of art or creative or academic individuals and Lauren and Kim. And the way together, we formed a team that was very successful in launching the lockdown collection. And the point I wanna make is just because I'm a business person doesn't make me evil, doesn't make me disinterested in social issues and the environment and the like. However, that said, your point is entirely true that some businesses have boards that your word are evil and have people who are only interested in one of the stakeholders. Mm. We have boards who get caught in, uh, in, in fights with the founders, the entrepreneurs, and all of that that come along in this journey. We have boards that have people who are, are appointed to them who fundamentally shouldn't even be a director, and mm -hmm. that's often for other reasons, and, and we don't need to go into that in, in this discussion. But at the core of all of those boards, I can guarantee you a couple of things. They're not going to have directors who are actively engaging in their own personal development. So we say as a director, if you're a good director, you need to be actively engaging in your development and, as a director. You also need, at Sadar, we would say, you also need to be exceptionally critical of your own performance. And that means you can't go and fire the chief executive of the business because the business isn't performing and say it was his or her fault. As the board, you have to own the fact that if the business mm. isn't performing, the board plays a role in, in that outcome. Mm. The third thing is I can guarantee you those boards are not having regular board evaluations. Where they're sitting down with good quality processes, and I'm going to comment on that in a moment, and having a really good board evaluation that's giving an outcome that doesn't just say, hey, you did a good job, pat on the back. And I'd go yes. as far as this. If you're a director listening to this conversation, and you think you had a good board evaluation. And there's not something in that board evaluation that told you you were doing a bad job that felt like it hurt you, like it was difficult to read because it made you reflect mm. on yourself, then it wasn't a good board evaluation. Board mm. evaluations need to challenge you to be a better director. And if they don't, they haven't gone deep enough. Mm. And then the last part is board selection and rotation. Too many businesses just appoint someone because they are the shareholder or because they're a friend or because they're whoever. And mm. you don't go through the sort of quality of appointment process that you would expect in order to have a really good board. Now, we know in our businesses, if we don't follow a good appointment process, we get bad results and we have turnover and we have recruitment issues. The mm. problem on our board is we go, oh, let's get someone we don't have to pay. We put them on the board. And we get the results that that deserves. So, 
Yeah, really important that if you're yes. looking at a bad board, look deeper and go, what are the things they're not doing? Mm -hmm. We would call it Sadara methodology. What, what methodology are they following to be a great board? If they're following mm -hmm. the Sadara methodology and applying it, that's possibly a good start. But are they doing it? So we'd want to see. And if they're working with us, then you might get a lot more confidence about their performance as a board. So that was a bit of a passionate answer there. I love it. I love it. Passion away.